Hello and welcome to Unheard. We don't normally go in for stories about Hollywood actors or celebrities, but this week we are making a bit of an exception. The case of Ezra Miller, an actor whose behaviour has kind of spiralled out of control recently, seems to hint at something bigger. The movie that made Miller famous back in 2011 was We Need to Talk About Kevin based on Lionel Shriver's prize-winning novel of the same name about a troubled teenager who eventually commits a school shooting. A central question in that book is whether or not the way we treat young people can contribute to making them mentally unwell. Is Miller in some way an example of the troubles of a whole generation? In trying to be so permissive and understanding, are we driving young people crazy? Here to explore these themes with us is none other than Lionel Shriver herself, the best-selling author of We Need to Talk About Kevin and many other novels, whose own collection of essays called Abominations comes out next month in September. So welcome, Lionel. Nice to talk to you, Freddie. I thought we'd kick off by just doing a little update for any viewers who have not followed this controversy and they've been on summer vacations and hopefully for them they don't know that much about it. Let's fill them in with what Ezra Miller has been up to. So Miller became famous back in 2011. There you see a poster of the movie of your book starring as the, the troubled teen. And already a year after that, there was an interview in Out magazine where Miller came out as queer. This is a quote. I don't identify. Like, fuck that. Queer just means no. I don't do that. I don't identify as a man. I don't identify as a woman. I barely identify as a human. Miller became a bit of a pin-up, a bit of a queer icon in the years after that, turning up to openings and parties in all sorts of flamboyant outfits and becoming a spokesperson for the queer movement. Fast forward to 2020s and things looked a little bit tougher. The video emerged of Miller attacking a fan outside a venue and grabbing her by the throat and throwing her to the ground, which people were understandably very upset about. Miller was then arrested in Hawaii after having struck a 26-year-old woman on the forehead. So that's the report. The LA Times then reported about a rather strange grooming story where a non-binary queer child who was 12 at the time became very close to Miller and moved in and the parents were a little bit anxious about it. They said if anybody questions Ezra's actions, Ezra says they're being racist or transphobic which is not the case in our case. It's not about hurting people. Don't take advantage of people. Fast forward to this summer and there were more accusations. A new restraining order after pressing up against a non-binary child, reports the Mail. Guns, bullets and weed, reported the Rolling Stone uh, in June after a family that had moved in with Miller then became the subject of an interesting story where the father of that family made certain accusations. I'm quoting here from Rolling Stone. Video footage appears to show at least eight assault weapons, rifles and handguns lying around the living room with some weapons propped up next to a pile of stuffed animals. That apparently was the circumstance of that young family living with Miller and that caused a lot of controversy. Later the same month, the German woman accused Miller of threatening abusive behavior. Fast forward to August, Miller was charged with burglary. Later the same month, again accused of grooming minors and leading a cult based in an Airbnb in Reykjavik. And all of this led this week to an apology by the actor who finally addressed all of these repeated stories, saying, having recently gone through a time of intense crisis, I now understand that I am suffering complex mental health issues and have begun ongoing treatment. I want to apologize to everyone that I have alarmed and upset with my past behavior. I'm committed to doing the necessary work to get back to a healthy, safe and productive stage in my life. So Lionel, it's a sad story there. I mean, obviously, we can't vouch for the facts of any particular of those reports, but clearly the actor who played the central role in, in your story back in 2011 has had a strange and difficult few years. 
What was your first reaction seeing that story? Oh, sorrow. I, 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 I share your primary reaction that uh, this seems terribly wasteful. Um, the young man whom I met in 2011 uh, was uh, very talented. I would have to say he was quite arrogant and, and full of himself, but I, I dismiss that primarily as a result of his age, and also that's what happens with child actors. I mean, they, they get kind of puffed up with their own importance. And it's, I mean, it's even a, a sweet aspect to that because you know that eventually life will come along and they'll get their comeuppance. Um, and, and he was quite talented. He, you know, the performance in uh, the film is, is superb. And he had, he had great expectations of himself. And I think what we see from afar uh, is tragic. It's a waste. It's, uh, it's, it looks to me as if he's falling apart. And, um, and I don't think that's totally his fault. I do think that this is taking place in a social context, and that's what we're here to talk about. So let's just start with any connection to your novel. Obviously, we don't want to overemphasize this. It's not like Miller has gone in and taken part in a school shooting. There's just stories of, you know, errant and, and difficult behavior. But is there any parallel, do you think, in the sense of how you treat young people or what kind of boundaries they're given leads to them developing in certain ways? Do you think we can draw any lessons from that read across? I'm reluctant to draw too many parallels between mere fiction and, and real life. And I'm also reluctant to get on my high horse and talk about uh, what kind of parenting we require when I don't have any kids. <laughs> That's, you know, I, I, I inherently do not know what I am talking about. Um, but uh, I see Ezra's deterioration as um taking place in a context where he's he's both be, being given not enough guidance and and the uh, the guidance he he's being given is destructive uh obviously very caught up in um a confused gender identity i think the whole business of claiming to be non-binary is patently absurd uh, and because we are binary and you can't change that. Now, I should clarify, uh, back in 2016, I did a, an essay for a Prospect magazine and um, looking at the whole issue of gender, in, in which I maintained that, yeah, in today's modern parlance, I guess I don't, quote, identify as a woman, by which I mean, and that's not a, a formulation I would generally use, by which I mean, I do not experience myself alone in a room as primarily female. And I question the whole idea of self, the experience of self, that is with yourself, who you feel like. Um, I question whether or not that, that is a gendered experience. And I think that, and, and that's one reason that as a fiction writer, I find it very easy to craft male characters and some People wonder, well, how do you pull that off? Well, the secret is there is no secret. Uh, the experience of being a person is fundamentally the same, whether you're born male or female. And therefore, it doesn't take a great leap of the imagination to think of yourself as a, as a, as a male character or, or vice versa for male writers. And it's male writers in particular who try to be women, to think too hard about what it must be like to be a woman who fail, because, because it's not that different. So there is something in this identity of, oh, I'm non-binary, that is getting it as a certain truth. I think that in terms of our experience of personhood, of our, our reflections with ourselves, our, our sense of walking down the street and being us. I think that is not a, a, a fundamentally gendered experience. I think that we experience being male or female uh, mostly in social contexts. 
So while I may not feel especially female or male, you know, I don't feel like a particular sex when I'm just by myself, when I interact with other people, I concede that I'm perceived as female and biologically that's exactly what I am. So, you know, others are not being untoward in any way. So that's what you're getting at there. And I should say, I just asked you to take your glasses off because we were getting a lot of reflection. So this is not a conspiracy. This is the same Lionel without glasses. <laughs> this is Lionel who cannot see her interview. Right, anymore. but, but the, it's all in the voice. <laughs> you can hear me, hopefully. So what you're saying is it's, it's certainly understandable not to want to put too much emphasis on gender in your identity and to want to not center that. But it is quite remarkable, isn't it, how so many of the younger people who are clearly going through difficult times at the moment seem to express it via gender-related issues. Do you think that's fair? Like, there, there is, does seem to be a correlation here. And these kind of gender questions quite often go alongside difficult periods and angsty periods. It's almost like the current way to express angst. Yes, both angst and personhood, individuality. But the odd thing about this form of individuality is that it's, it's within the context of cliché, within the context of stereotype. And it's one of my biggest problems with this whole movement is that in order to construct this bizarre uh, set of multiple identities, uh, it's all based on very superficial aspects of, of traditional masculinity and femininity. I mean, look at all that ludicrous garb that Ezra is wearing in those photographs. It's, it's, a preposterous exaggeration of of mostly feminine styles, you know, wearing leopard prints and and very elaborate makeup. And well, I don't I don't care about playing dress up, but this is not an identity. And I, I honestly think one of the problems here is that word and what what we think it means. When I was younger, people were certainly concerned with having a sense of identity, but it was understood to be um, a sense of rootedness, a sense of self-possession, of, of being comfortable in your own skin, of having a sense of purpose and feeling at ease with others. It, it is, it's what everyone wanted for themselves, but it, 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 was, it was a personal project about knowing, knowing where you're from, knowing where you're going, and knowing where you are now. And it's, it, it didn't have to do with a bunch of stereotypes. And I, it, this whole expression, identify as, is a problem because it's outside you. It's like you see something out there and you say, oh, that's me. I don't think that it's that absurd, given the construction, even grammatically, that some people are now identifying as cats. After all, if you can see something out there and say, oh, I'm, I'm that now. I'm that now, and everyone else has to treat me as if I'm that. There's no reason why you can't identify as a cat or as a lamppost, right? And the other poisonous concept is that we are now, in some contexts, in the, like in the UK, legally required to get with your program. Whatever you say you are, we have to we have to treat you that way. And that you know, it was very interesting to me to read a couple of articles about what's happening to Ezra Miller, and and it, often in um, you know, story mainstream publications like the LA Times, and I, I'm sure that it's this is a, a requirement uh, uh, for journalists. He's referred to as they throughout, they and them and their, and these the text is incoherent. 
It's also comical. And uh, it, it's wildly ungrammatical. It's ridiculous. It's hard to understand. And and it's it's a performance. It's indulgent. OK. And that's that's, I guess, we're getting at what you were talking about. Which is really a, a failure of the adults. It's not a failure of the generation we're talking about. It's the generation before. Which, which has been so pliant and, and I would say indulgent. And instead of saying, what do you mean? This is the LA Times. You're a singular male person and we're going to call you he. It's like, oh, oh, they, them. We're going to make our text incoherent and we're even going to doctor direct quotes from our interviewees and insert they and them when they've used he, he and him. And that's bad journalism. I mean, that's, that's inaccurate. That's not what that person said. But no, we have to get, we have to get with someone else's program. And this, this thing is spinning out of control because it's, we no longer recognize exterior reality. And um, that's, to me, that's one of the most important things about this whole gender movement is that we are losing touch with physic what is what physically is and the truth is you do not have complete control over who you are you were you were born in a particular place that's a matter of historical and physical fact to particular parents whether or not you like them um, uh, at a particular historical time um, you are perceived to be one race or whatever, but you don't have complete control over what race people see you as. Um, and you do not control whether you are male or female. I mean, I could go on. There are just lots of aspects of yourself that you're not in control of. I would love to be six foot two. I'm five foot two, you know, and I cannot make people treat me as if I'm six foot two because I identify as a tall person. So here's the question. It starts as a very good natured and well intentioned concept, doesn't it? Because it's this whole sort of more indulgent progressive parenting is all about letting the individual flower, you know, not being overly conservative or constraining. Um, and were we in the end of the 1950s, it might feel like that was really called for. And there's definitely a sense that every parent wants their child to, you know, blossom into the perfect individual that they want to be. And it's a, it's a well-meant movement, isn't it? But it feels like there's a danger that it actually does harm to those young people, because if they're not reminded that they can't actually just self actuate every fantasy, they can get into trouble. And, and perhaps Ezra Miller is an example of someone who has been indulged by society because of their, you know, Hollywood actor status. And it doesn't seem like it's going that well for Ezra Miller. Do you think that's fair? Again, I just have to fall back on what other parents have said in the past, because I'm not a parent. But it's clear that children do flourish given limits and total freedom is a kind of hell. Um, I think that one of the things that's happened in the last couple of generations, and I've thought about writing an essay about this, is that we have uh, reconstituted the concept of self and the concept of character. Now, in the past, Character is something you build. And this also connects with this idea of what is identity, that you, you make yourself into the kind of person that you aspire to. So you, you become physically fit or you learn to, do, to, to speak different languages. You become educated. You honor your parents or whatever. It's... You build your own character. 
which is very different from just seeing something out there and identifying as it, and, and, and that's it. You, it, through discipline and hard work and adherence to certain principles, you become the kind of person that you would want to. And now we have a completely different model whereby you were born as something already. It's ready-made, and it's up to you to discover this wonderful being that you already are. And everyone else has to uh, get with you in whatever you discover about this splendid, you know, a pre-made, wonderful person, whoever that turns out to be. And it's, it's just a very different idea of what it means to grow up. So um, it's, it's identity. What it, what it means to be an adult. So, what, so what you're saying is identity is revealed by your behavior over time and is an ongoing project rather than a kind of piece of code hidden somewhere inside you that just plays out automatically. It's quite an interesting fundamental difference. That you're pointing to yeah I mean that 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 um, identity is in first of all an entirely interior business it doesn't have to do with social context it doesn't it, it's not managing the exterior facts of your existence it is it is only you know who you are and you can you know and, and also we're dealing with this kind of ultimate extension of what Americans were supposed to always tell their children is that you can grow up to be what, whatever you want. Of course, this is a total lie, but it's a popular lie. Um, so you, now we, now we're telling people that you can grow up basically to be a tree. I mean, right. Um, and I, I, I think that we, we, we now, you know, we, we're telling our children that they are already this fully formed thing. And I think that's a terrible thing to tell children because they're not. And it's putting on them, oh, it's up to me to discover whatever it is I am. And if I'm feeling uncomfortable in my own skin, if I'm, if I, then, then it's up to me to just figure out what to identify as and I'll feel better. I mean, there is something going on here, very fundamental that helps explain why we have so much trouble with mental health in in children and adolescents now, and I and where we are telling them they have to discover for themselves their own being, rather than say you know you have to get to bed at eight thirty and do your homework. Um, we're even telling children as young as four or five years old that they have to decide what sex they are. It's asking too much of children, in other words. It, it ends up being a, a stress. Let me, th let me throw in another important element into this, which is this whole question of mental health, because that's also very much wrapped into this Ezra Miller story. And of course, there, when he or when Miller did the apology, it was all about mental health. So I've been suffering from mental health uh, difficulties. I'm now going to do the work to try and uh, improve that. And no doubt, the, that list of uh, actions doesn't look like someone who is especially mentally well. But I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Do you think there's any way in which the culture around how we talk about mental health in some way kind of medicalizes or provides an excuse for bad behavior where the first thing you do if you get caught doing weird or inappropriate things is come out as having a mental health problem, which makes it much harder to sort of answer for those actions. Do you think there's something going on there? Uh, I think there is an impulse to remove personal responsibility in this because the, the idea of having a difficulty with mental health problems is that it, it is as if you are afflicted with some, something. It comes from the outside. It is, it is as if you have a, di you know, a, a disease. It's, it's happened to you. It's not. So it puts responsibility for your behavior outside yourself. That this is, this is a problem that, is, that you have been saddled with 
but not it has nothing to do with choice, right? Having made certain decisions that were dumb or destructive. And I don't I certainly don't want to seem unsympathetic with uh, younger people or anyone who is feels afflict, afflicted with mental health problems. But at the same time, it's pretty clear that we've had so much discussion of this issue in recent years that it's joined the sea of various victimhoods that uh, that younger people are taught to covet. And it's, it's, I, I sometimes get the impression that, that everyone needs or wants a diagnosis, that it's, that there's an element of prestige in it, as well as a get out of jail free card, because, you know, anything you do, oh, well, I have trouble with anxiety. Um, well, no, I, I didn't write my paper, but you know, that's because I, I, I have problems with depression. It's, you know, you can get out of, um, get off, get out of all kinds of, of difficulties. And, and the difficulty here, I, I, I can already, yeah. I already feel like we're, we're on dicey ground here because neither you or I are mental health professionals. And that's the first, you know, that's the first critique that is raised if you start freelancing on this topic. And obviously, these are serious issues. You mentioned, you know, depression, anxiety, and of course, people suffer from those things. But it must also be possible to point out that if it's, if it becomes too easy a diagnosis, or if too many people feel that that's available to them as an explanation, it could actually be bad for their mental health because suddenly they then, you know, are diving in to their own souls every day, looking for the latest signs of their own disorder instead of just getting on with their life and behaving better. Well, I think there's a problem when, when a mental health diagnosis becomes a source of prestige. And just in general, I don't, I don't think that we are socially putting enough value on resilience, on toughening up. I mean, it is the absolute opposite of the kind of values that we embraced, you know, post-World War II, my parents' generation. Uh, you were supposed to, you know, take difficulties on the chin and learn from your mistakes, learn from failure, resolve to do better. Um, and and face adversity with strength and and understanding and wisdom and none of this applies anymore and you know it's been observed by lots of other commentators I'm I'm not alone in this that we're never we're no longer al allowing or kids to grow up. We don't encourage them to grow up. We don't encourage them to become real adults who take responsibility for themselves, um, are, are not going to be dependents on their parents or the state. We need these people. <laughs> They're going to keep us going. Um, they, need to, they need to, you know, earn money and, and have homes. And they can't live with mommy and daddy forever. Mommy and daddy are going to die. Uh, we, we need a healthy, competent set of adults coming up behind us to carry on the society. And therefore, the fact that we are not really turning children into grown-ups anymore in, in, in many instances is very disturbing. Do you think there's something about the kind of worship of youth that is particular to this moment? It strikes me that most previous human societies were basically run by older people. Um, obviously with exceptions, but that's the, that's the general trend. And it seems that something came along with the idea of progress, that if you're certain about the arc of history moving forward or the escalator of progress moving in one direction, suddenly young people 
move from being just kids who need to be told what to do to being in some way prophets of the future because whatever they say is a glimpse into the future and we all like to be ahead of the times and it feels almost like we're in this kind of Greta Thunberg generation now where the younger the person the more wisdom they're perceived to have and old people are kind of shuffled on at a younger and younger age and considered irrelevant. I'm now sounding like a real grandpa here. I'm, I'm, going, <laughs> I'm going full kind of atavistic uh, on this, but it, I think it might be true. Should we be tilting society back towards letting older people run things? <laughs> well, of course, you know, I'm speaking to you from um, New York. So in the United States, if you look at who's running the country, we don't have a problem. Yeah, that is, that's well made. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, gerontocracy has become a commonplace noun in U.S. journalism. So um, that's, I, I, I can't argue I with think, that. I think, but, but I think that socially you've got a point. And, um, and again, I think in, it's most on display in the whole gender discussion where you've got the grown-ups. No, the grown-ups are, are, are not saying, don't be ridiculous. No, you're not a little girl. You're a little boy. You can wear a dress if you want, but that doesn't change it. We're not even actively humoring children. We're actually requiring ourselves to get with get down with them in the playpen and and and, and that's our that's our reality it's ridiculous but par parents are almost afraid of their children in some of these areas some of i've seen it i think we all have where you have teenage children involved and the parents don't want to fall out with them and so they're saying whatever just to make sure they don't cross some sort of new moral boundary that has been imposed by the teenager. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. I don't know how much this translates into who's actually running things, but I do think that um, this indulgence that we were talking about earlier, which extends to to the whole gender business and using the right pronouns and everything. It also uh, expresses itself uh, in the larger social justice movement, the um, obsession with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at the very upper le levels of government, of uh, charitable foundations, of corporations now. It is a very youth-driven movement. And you've got people, you know, in their 60s and 70s who who have embraced all of this terminology and this way of thinking, who walk around talking about systemic racism all the time. I mean, that that again, this is where the grown-ups are failing to be grown-ups. They're not saying, I'm sorry, this is a corporation. It, we're supposed to make money for our shareholders. Our primary job is not to perfectly reflect the demography of the country. Um, and, you know, we, we, we will adhere to certain sound principles, but otherwise we're going to focus our energies on making a product that other people want to buy. You know, no, no, we don't have that. We have, we have corporations at the very top going completely nuts. And, and this is, a, this is true across the board. So, you know, you can say that this is, this is a drive to make young people happy. It certainly has happened in publishing. You've got staff, you know, basically editorial assistants who are determining what books can and cannot be published because some of them, you know, these, these people will refuse to work on. And, and, and the companies are actually capitulating. I thought it was a sign of, of health, and as, as in the terms we're talking adulthood, that Netflix um, basically told um, <clears throat> the staff that were unhappy with the J Dave Chappelle stand-up, in which he said some rude things about transgender people, well, 
tough luck. And then when um, they had to downsize a little bit uh, and, and fire a raft of people, lo and behold, the, the people that got fired were the same people who were making a big hoo-ha about Dave Chappelle because there are consequences to your behavior. So, you know, that, that was a competent company acting like a competent company. But I'm, I wish we saw that more often. Do you think, so I'm trying to square now because I'm conscious that I just said, hey, the world is run by young people. And you quite correctly said that the president of the US is far from young. And there's a lot of examples of really quite elderly people who are at least nominally in charge. Maybe the reality is that both of those ideas are true in some horrible way, because what you've got is old people running things, but trying to please the young people. It's that it's the worst of all worlds where you got you got grandpa and grandma trying to be down with the kids. Yeah, it's pandering. It's constant pandering to a, a, an ethos that is, you know, two gener at least two generations removed from you. And it means that you may not even understand what you're pandering to. Um, but it doesn't mean you give the reins of control to these people. In publishing, that is effectively happening. But mostly, it's people who are quite old, still in control, but think that they can stay in control by mouthing these verities that, that, that they have inherited from much younger people. And it, it's, it's, it's cynical, actually. Uh, so they don't, there's no desire to sacrifice power. Nobody's resigning. Nobody's saying, I'm going to give up my CEO position to this, you know, 23-year-old who, who, who understands about the importance of climate change. They're not, they're not resigning. They're just going to talk a lot about climate change. We started off talking about Ezra Miller. Do you think Ezra Miller may be a kind of extreme example of, in a way, what we're doing across the generation then? Are we, are we in danger of creating a whole generation of Ezra Millers here? Because obviously it's, it's an extreme case if you're a Hollywood star and everyone sucks up to you and everyone's nice to you and says yes to your every whim, and that is probably you know, escalates and speedens up the process. But these kind of 23-year-olds that you're talking about, in a way, are having a similar kind of world around them, which is that impulses they feel or whimsies and ideas they feel are no one is saying no to them. Um, so they, are, they become kind of monsters in some way. Are we creating a generation of Ezra Millers? I see a lot of them. Um, I, I think that a, a lot of younger people are lost. Now, younger people have often been lost. So this isn't unique to this generation. It's part of being young is either being lost or trying things on for size, right? So, and then later deciding that they don't fit. That is the nature of the animal and it's timeless. Um, that's why it's commonplace to think back on your own youth with some embarrassment. <laughs> um, but I think that we have led a, a generation astray by indicating to them that if they simply get the right relationship to their sex, let's talk about sex, not gender, their, the right relationship to their sex, then they will know who they are. You know, I talked about an, a, a more old fashioned sense of identity. That's another thing that hasn't changed, right? Everyone needs, has a need to feel at ease with themselves. To, and, and I believe that this self creation, I, it's not necessarily about self knowledge, that is the discovery of who you really are, but the building of the self. And that, that it continues your whole life. It's not something that you just do when you're young. It's, I am always in, an, in a state of self-creation, coming, coming to re refining who I am, which mostly has to do with what I want to do next. And what is my purpose? 
what do I want to accomplish? And that's really, in some ways, an identity issue. It is. Uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with sex. Um, it doesn't have to do with, you know, am I going to be male or female today or something in between? And I think this is just leading people up the garden path. I don't care if you, you know, if you wear, uh, if you put on stockings and, 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 and smoke a pipe and, you know, put in some kind of confused little signals of, in relation to uh, gender stereotypes. But that's not going to tell you who you are. That's not going to give you a sense of purpose. That's not an answer to what to do with your life or what to do this evening or whether you're happy. You know, uh, it's it doesn't help. And it's it is it is a false answer. And it's, it's as if, you know, if you just come up with the right outfit, then you'll you'll know what to do with yourself. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It's a superficial and fundamentally silly uh, solution to something that all people have always faced. And that is the clock is ticking. What do you want to do? Lionel Schreiber, thank you so much. Enjoy talking to you, Freddie. That was Lionel Shriver, author of the best-selling book, We Need to Talk About Kevin which is an exploration of how a young person went horribly wrong. Talking to us about the actor who played Kevin in that movie, Ezra Miller. Now, I want to be clear. There is no easy read across between her work of fiction about a homicidal teen and a child and now young adult actor imploding publicly in newspaper reports. It's certainly not the first time we've seen that happen. But what Lionel was asking about gender, mental health, and the whole culture of self-actualization among younger people seemed interesting and important to me. Wishing Ezra Miller all the best on the road to recovery, and with thanks to you for tuning in, this was Unheard.